set up. Uh, first and foremost, thank you all very much for taking some time out of your schedules to come and sit and listen tonight. Um, this is the second opportunity our community conversations groups had, has had an opportunity to speak with the public regarding uh, risk youth behavior survey results and also just different trends and things that are going on not only in our community but in the state of New Hampshire. So a um, couple of the things I guess that our group has helped facilitate uh, for the last two years with chiefs in the department's help We've had Red Ribbon Week uh, during April, uh, during the third week of April. Our kids have been on the radio promoting that. They have uh, had like demonstrations, uh, some guest speakers at the high school, just really help in, inform our students. But really, I think what was great about that, our students took the lead, our student health classes took the lead, and really implemented, put those things together, went out and got the, the speakers, um, and did sort of the facilitating of that whole week. Um, also coming out of this, I guess kind of a byproduct would be your restorative justice program, Juvenile Restor Restorative Justice Program, and I'm sure Chief will talk about that. Um, but really, I think the, the, we put this together two years ago now, really to take a look at, as a community, some of the issues that our youth are facing. Um, I've said this since day one, this isn't just a school issue, this is just a police issue, this is our community's issue. Uh, so we have Chief, myself, Mindy, um, Jackie, a few other people from the community that, that come and participate and be a part of our group. Um, again, we're just trying to pass information along and, and really taking a look at what it is that our youth is facing. Um, and, and tonight's topic is going to be on vaping. And I, I know I've talked to some folks about it. People are like, well, well, what is it? Hopefully, you'll walk out of here at least knowing what it is. Um, because I think those are the things that we need to be aware of. I have three children, my youngest is in fourth grade. And when I see and read some of this stuff and hear about some of this stuff, it just frightens me. Right? It frightens me. And, and, and I'm sure we'll talk about the advertising and how it's targeting towards kids. But, um, so without further ado, I will introduce our panel for tonight. Uh, our principal, Monahan, will be speaking at the Risk Behavior Survey. Uh, Chief, I'm going to ask you to in introduce your, because I forgot already. Sheriff John Simons of Sullivan County. Thank you. <coughs> and you know, Chief Cahill, our uh, police chief. And this is Amanda LaDuke. And Amanda, and you are the new. So, um, go ahead. Yeah, so I'm a substance There are lots of handouts, cookies and water in the back. Um, we'll get started again with Sean. The risk behavior survey has been given in the state of New Hampshire to all uh, high schoolers. Uh, it used to be just 11th grade, but it's, now it's all high schoolers in the past probably six or eight years. And it's given every other year. Some of the, prior to me getting here, you used to take the survey. At some point in time, that stopped for a while. We started, we took it, started taking it again, excuse me, in 2015. This would have been 2017, so we have two years, sort of worth of data we can look at and try to go over again what, what the alcohol trends are, what smoking trends are, what safe behavior, what some of the unsafe behaviors are. And so that just gives you, a, gives us a picture of not only um, how we're doing as far as when we're looking to um, promote and, and look at programs that we put in place and see what those effects are, but also look at ourselves compared to the county and look at ourselves statistically compared to the state. So, Sean, I'll let you. All right, I'll start. Um, for those of you who have looked at the youth risk survey, there's all kinds of information. I'm certainly not going to, going to go through all of it. There's a lot of information on drug use, alcohol it's use. It's on our website as well. It's on our, want to look at. Thank you. It's on our website. So drug use, alcohol use, um, bullying information, health <coughs> information, um, sexual habits. There's just, it's pages and pages of things. Um, I always tell people one of the nice things, one of the, the nice advantages we have um, our students, for the most part, are rules followers, and they want to please people. And I think even as we look at things, we're going to see things like our use of drug use is lower than the state average. Our use of alcohol, which is interesting, is a little bit above it. Um, our cigarette smoking is below it. But you can s a couple positives we take is that there's lots of messages that they see, and I think when they see those messages, Oftentimes they take them to heart, and that's why a lot of the conversation today, I think, is really going to be towards the vaping, because it's so new to a lot of us, including me. You know, I've been a principal now for over 15 years. I've been dealing with the drugs, and I've been dealing with the alcohol and the, and the cigarettes. And I will say, 
at Sanofi, it's been less than I've dealt with in other schools to a certain point, not that we haven't had them elsewhere, but I can't tell you the last time I had somebody smoke a cigarette in the bathroom. You know, it's we will have occasionally a student who comes under the influence of drugs. Usually, frankly, there's somebody who came from another school and then they figure out that's not going to be accepted and, and things, things along those lines. Um, and the trends are going in a very positive manner as well. They, they, they are going down. So I think most of the, as you look through the data, you're going to see that most of the numbers are comparatively good. Now you look at you know some of those numbers, you're still, you still hope, boy, I, I really wish we didn't have you know, that percentage of students thinking that they're, even that their parents think it's okay to be smoking marijuana and things like that. But all in all, um, the numbers are, are pretty decent. Um, one thing we have, have seen, however, is um, the percentage of students who use electronic vape, vapor product one or more times during their life. So this year, and it, I, I wish I could say it surprised me, maybe it surprises me a little bit, over 42% of our students have tried vaping at some point in time. And I'm not going to be the one who presents all the information on the vaping. I've, I've learned a lot more information this year on it. But sometimes there's a drug component to it. Um, our students this year did say the number of students who have used synthetic marijuana one or more times during their life, which is often through that vaping, is 4%. Um, so I think that the majority of the students who are doing it are using it for the nicotine piece to it. But it's very easy to hide. Um, I think parents have very limited knowledge of it. And again, as I go back to where our students really want to please and are rules followers, I think some of the messages they receive are difficult. And I brought this example up that, you know, when marijuana becomes legalized or becomes, you know, all of a sudden that's a message to our kids. And I'm not saying I agree with it or disagree with it. I'm just saying that's something that our students pay attention to. And for those of you who have been driving through towns recently, um, you know, vaping stores are common. And so all of a sudden when there's three vaping stores in the town that I go through, all of a sudden I think the message sometimes is, that's not that bad. I, you know, and, and I think a lot of times when the kids get the message, it is bad, you know, they won't be doing that. My daughter went to a college where there was a, there was a, a welcome center that had the welcome center and the other half of it was a vape store for the most part. So I think that these are <coughs> messages, I, again, our kids oftentimes take their messages from us. I think these are ones where we're just a little bit behind the curve, and that's, that's okay. We, we get caught up with the curve, but we get more information. I spent a lot of time this year, um, I've caught some kids vaping in the bathroom. I've found some things. I'm looking, you know, I'm going online, I'm finding things. You know, one of the flavors I found this year was cotton candy. So in the past, you know, you go through the, you go in the bathroom, you smell the, t you know, you, you smell the cigarette smoke, and you're like, okay, so, somebody was smoking. We have a small school. We can usually figure that, that out. Now it's I'd be, why does the bathroom smell like cotton candy? <laughs> you know, or one of the flavors could be coffee. So was somebody just, did somebody just bring a cup of coffee and they you know, they got the Dunkin' Donuts, or was somebody vaping? It goes, it goes away quickly. Um, the smell of it. So we have had some kids. Um, we certainly have kids doing that. They're telling us we have 42 percent who are doing it. We have had some kids that we've caught doing it. And I always say at Sonopy, one of the nice things is it's really good when we get somebody doing something because. The kids don't want to disappoint. They learn from that. So I always know when something like that happens that we're going to have a period of time where we won't have that happen again. You know, even with the, our alcohol levels, for the most part, you know, I'm pretty certain that in June, if there's a big arrest on an underage drinking party, more often than not, it's not going to be the kids from Sunapee who are there. Now, again, it doesn't mean Sunapee kids aren't drinking because they are. We see that. But they don't want to disappoint. They want to follow the rules of those things. So um, hopefully... I was say more than hopefully. I'm, I'm very confident that the police will be able to give you a lot of information on what this is, but it is certainly something that we're starting to see at Sunapee. Um, again, our kids are great. Um, they've got lots of healthy habits, as we've seen, um, but they're not perfect, and we see some, some areas where, where they struggle. And this is one of the areas that's concerning me because it's a high level, and I don't think we've done enough because we don't know so much yet on what the dangers are all those things, and, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll get better at that. Sean, was there a follow-up question to that? So it said one or more times in the past year. Was there a follow-up that you've done it more than one time, or is that kids that have tried it and didn't like it and stopped? We don't know. Yeah, we didn't, we didn't have that. We didn't have that question. Right? So the vaping? The yeah. vaping. 
So the three questions that were, if you don't mind, three questions no, that were um, talked about for vaping was uh, the number and percent of students who currently, first of all, smoke cigarettes. So that's important to have an understanding of where we are with cigarettes compared to vaping. Uh, 9.8% of our students, and what we're talking about is 144 students, just the high school. So 9.8% is 14 out of our 143 currently smoke cigarettes. And then we move into electronic vaping, and it's the number of percentage of students who have ever used it, 42% said they have. The percentage of, um, of the students who are currently used an electronic vapor in the last day, in the past 30 days, 25.6% of the kids. So more than half of the ones who admit to using it appears to be using it consecutively or concurrently throughout the, um, their life. So certainly one in four. One in four is using it relatively routinely. And I think the big issue is, is we're comparing smoking, which used to be, I think, a big, a big, a big popular thing to do among youth probably back in my day, and we've now transformed to, we're smarter as a society and as a community to say, we know the health risks that are associated with those. Um, it's on TV and our family and friends and people that we know are dying from the cancers. So we've gotten away from that and now this vaping, I'll tell you, I'm no expert in vaping, but this vaping is going to be the next epidemic with our youth that's coming forward. Um, so I, I, I guess I'll start. I have a 15 slides, but there's a couple of videos. I'm not an expert for vaping, but I find myself <coughs> routinely researching all kinds of problems that happen and trying to get the message out to the community, to the officers, so that we can um, kind of combat the problem. So I will um, run through the, the um, slideshow real quick. I will tell you that we did have technical difficulties at 2 o'clock this afternoon with this, um, but with the great help of our library director, uh, we're going to work through it. Um, shouldn't be that long, but I think I can sit and talk to you, but I think the videos that you're going to see from California, um, I believe into Texas and then back into New Hampshire, um, are all the videos on there. The last video is probably seven minutes long, but it's the Surgeon General talking about the vaping, and I think it's important to hear from um, such a qualifying person as our Surgeon General. So he'll be the last video that I'll show you on here, and I think that's important because he'll probably accumulate everything that we've seen and heard since then. So what is vaping and who's doing it? Um, the vaping is <coughs> actual, um, is inhaling water, vapor into the lungs. If nobody's seen these, there's another thing called juuling, and you'll see that that will come up through here as well. Juuling, vaping, so it's a uh, <coughs> cylindrical object, and you'll see it as you go through there. The battery, which is the ignition part, it has a heater, which is the vaporizer, and it as you draw through the water into the heat, it vaporizes it into almost like a steam. So it's not a smoke, as Mr. Moynihan was saying. It's not a smoke, it's a steam, and so it's more of the smell. So you'll see as it comes down through, the problem with that is, is in order to get to that stage, it's chemicals. And it's chemicals that you're in there, and uh, going inside your body, and it's still nicotine. And like every good kid who's tearing things apart and trying to make things better, we have, our, we have kids who are going in, instead of putting drops of that in there, they're actually straining THC through marijuana plants, and they're putting that inside of our vaporizers, and now they're vaping marijuana, and there's a short video on that as well. Uh, electronic cigarettes, known as ENDS, um, the e-cigarettes, electronic nicotine delivery system, battery-powered devices, they heat up the mixtures of the nicotine and the ingredients. Um, people inhale the vapor produced by e-cigarettes. Instead of smoking, they call it vaping. Um, there's all kinds of different words for it. Um, I think an important thing that Mr. Moynihan um, brought out was, you'll see as we go through here, and I've put some handouts out there, these um, vapes or these um, jewels look like pens. They look like memory sticks, right? These little memory sticks that go inside of the computers. They will go inside of the computer because that computer will charge the battery inside of the jeweling tool, and that's what starts it up. When the teacher turns and looks towards the board and starts making a presentation, you'll see one of the videos, the kid pops out of the thing, does an inhale, puts it back in, and he's just inhaled right behind the teacher and has no idea. <clears throat> um, you can go right down here to Evans Fuel, and behind the lock and key are all the tobacco products, but right out behind the register, uh, not under a lock and key, is I think about 45 boxes of jeweling um, devices that you can buy right there. They're expensive, but the kids are obviously getting it. Um, there was a study in Los Angeles um, County Sheriff's Office, um, and more popular than ever, especially among the high school, school students, 
part of the issue is because of um, the tobacco days, R.J. Reynolds would, um, all their lawsuits of couldn't advertise in certain places, couldn't advertise and target the youth, alcohol campaigns, can't advertise and target the youths, but the cotton candy flavors, and you'll see the other stuff that's in here, are all targeting the youth. And those are the ones who are routinely or mostly buying these things. Our parents, or our people our age, aren't buying these vapes and these jewels that we can hide and try to disguise in front of people, because why would we, right? So any of those things that are made up to look like pens, look like USB ports, all that kind of stuff, is all targeting our youth. Um, Sheriff's Office and deputy have confiscated more and more vaping devices from their students um, because they are containing hidden marijuana flavor liquids. Um, the liquids, which can be highly concentrated amount of THC, there's a video, I don't know if it's in here, that I saw that they literally took plants of marijuana, put them in a, um, like a straining device of a, a rag or something, and poured liquids over it to, to remove the THC, turn it into a liquid, and that's what they were selling and put it on there. And if you think for a minute your kids can't go on the internet and can't buy this stuff on the dark web, the sheriff will talk about that. The sheriff runs the um, drug task force for our region in Sullivan County, covers 33 towns and cities from Lebanon on down to the Massachusetts border, and he'll talk a little about, about that as well. <coughs> this is where we, uh, so this is where the kids are, a uh, quick video on the kids that are vaping in the weed. I think something that uh, Mr. Moynihan pointed out is really uh, the point is, what is the message to our kids, right? What's the message? Alcohol, drugs, they're bad for you, they're illegal. Except that our state legislature and all their infinite wisdom has decided to decriminalize marijuana. It's still illegal, it just means that it's no longer a restable offense. It's a much of a citation on the side of the road like a speeding ticket. And actually your penalty doesn't get any more enhanced until you get caught like five or six times. <coughs> this is what they said. The police can't make any report as to where that goes to for a conviction. We can't share any of that information with the federal government. Um, so we have no idea if it's your first, second, or third. We don't even know where they're holding these convictions because it's not like a regular criminal court where I can run your record and you've been arrested for trespassing, for assault. We can't find any of that stuff. And they don't want us to report to the federal system because then it blocks you to buying firearms. Um, and it stops you from other things. And they don't want to even have us to report to that. The legislature went as far to say that they wanted to, um, if an officer were to arrest somebody for an offense that was uh, possession of marijuana when it was decriminalized, that the officer himself would be charged because they don't want kids being charged with marijuana charges. That didn't make it into the bill, but that was part of the conversation. I serve on the chief's um, legislative committee and that was one of the conversations that our representatives and our senators had um, to put this forward. So talk about a mixed message and I met with our senator and talked to her about um, voting against this and she looked at me and said, Chief, why would anybody ever want to decriminalize marijuana? And I said, so next year when the bill comes in to make it legal for recreational uses, it'll be less of a problem because it's already decriminalized. She said that's crazy. It wasn't six months later, and we're now at the legislature battling recreational marijuana because we want to fall more in line with what the rest of the states are doing in New England. <coughs> so this is the uh, out in California what they're finding with their studies and what the kids are using um, in their schools. Sorry. Nothing in life is free. I know. <laughs> I tried to figure out a way to skip it, but I yeah. couldn't know it's smart. My dream car would have all of them. I suppose those could be our teens, too, right? Looking for their dream cars. <laughs>
much higher, therefore making it more dangerous. Studies show it can be up to 30 times more concentrated. Deputy Cindy Romero with the LA County Sheriff's Department STAR program says kids bake pots before and after school, but are more likely to do it at home when parents aren't there. A Yale survey of nearly 4,000 high school students reveals 30% have admitted to trying marijuana. Of those teens, many say they've tried hash oil in an e-cig or THC wax in a vaporizer pen. Some of these things can be really, really altering someone's existence for the rest of their life. Pediatrician Dr. John Mangoni says heavy marijuana use can also affect the developing young brain, leading to memory loss and other abnormalities. And that'll affect some of the reasoning. The owner of this Ontario vaping store says they don't sell marijuana liquid or e-cigs to minors. But he adds, one thing parents can do is learn the difference. We will educate parents, and that is not something we can talk about. It's like you have to be a detective. You, you really do, and you have to be on top of it. And I, I feel like I never let my guard down. Mother of two, Ida Galusha, says vaping opens a whole new universe of worry for her as a parent. Don't ignore the problem, because the problem is there, and it's only getting worse. So we need to be proactive as parents. Brown says he vapes marijuana regularly. I do think there's, it's a good idea to wait until your brain's pretty developed before you start experimenting with stuff. <laughs> yeah, we, we didn't realize that. <laughs> so a couple of things. We know through um, our issues with alcohol abuse with the, our youth that we used to say that their brains were developing until they were probably in their early 20s, 21. We believe that now it's up, upwards of 25 to 27 years old. Um, that their brains are still constantly developing. Um, so I, it, to be doing the stuff at that age and ingesting all of those chemicals inside of your body um, from this, I mean, who wouldn't think that it's um, not good? My point is, is that as you see in these videos, um, I say that the Sunapee Police Department deals with the same amount of the same crimes that everybody else in the state of New Hampshire deals with, just at different levels, right? Um, we have um, the terrible crimes, we have drug cases, we have all of those, probably not as much as Manchester, probably not as much as um, some of our other towns or uh, Lebanon and stuff, but we still wrestle and still have those problems. These youth risk surveys support those theories, support those ideals. Um, it helps us with our training to what we're going to do and where we're going to go because we know what kind of issues we're going to deal with. Um, <coughs> and like I said, if you listen and watch these, this is the next epidemic, I believe, and a lot of law enforcement believes, and a lot of the professionals in the healthcare field believe, is the next epidemic for the youth that we're going to be, um, for our youth to be facing with um, at school and at home as well. This is the first one, but Julie, is this one you want to I think so, yeah. yeah. Julie, can I make one comment before yeah. we start that? The, uh, in that video, you saw there was a tube with a cover on it, and they were forcing the liquid down through the tube. That's that's called butane honey oil. And the, the way that they're able to make that liquid that the kids, are, uh, the kids and those folks are able to vape is by using butane fluid, which is the same stuff that's in your lighters. Uh, one of the issues is it's extremely volatile concoction, and there's been ex it's a very uh, high risk of explosion. There's been people killed by, by making that. Uh, it's called BTO, butane honey oil. And if they don't know what they're doing, and there's a spark in the room, and it, you know, and it lights that, uh, it's been known to blow half, the, half a house away while the person's been inside creating that oil. So I'm, uh, when, I, when it gets to my time, I'll, I'll talk about that stuff too, but it was on that video, so I just wanted to say that that's an extremely dangerous thing that they were doing, making that, uh, that oil. And if the sheriff doesn't talk about it, I'm going to remind them now. There's uh, what we call the one-pot methods, which is how we make crystal meth, or how the um, drug addicts make crystal meth. Um, it involves um, Coleman um, gasoline, um, alkaline from batteries, and you literally inside of a uh, two liter bottle. There's a picture there, Chief. Just start mixing it up, and it's a one pot method, and that's how they're making their meth. The problem is, is that there's been at least five house explosions uh, in the state of New Hampshire through these one pot methods, and the concern becomes for safety reasons is, this Saturday is green up day, right? What do they do when they have those? They don't want them, they throw them out the window. It'll sit and be dormant until somebody picks it up and goes, what's this? And that's when it becomes very dangerous and that's when it can blow up. And so I tell everybody, if you see a bottle on the side of the road, there's liquid in it and it doesn't resemble what the label is, leave it alone. But I think the sheriff will probably talk about that.
have my high school. They would vape on the bus just because it's like so easy to hide. It's, <coughs> it's just like a little like black pen. I can just vape at home. Like my parents don't know at all. When I'm riding my bike like long distances, it makes me feel like I'm riding away. And the reason I vape is to basically get away and get my mind to all the things. I was 13 years old when I vaped for the first time. I started buying five dollar vaporizers and from there, you know, I pulled out the big ones. So most of my friends that vape, they use nicotine. A lot of nicotine actually. Like because you can put as much nicotine into it as you want, like the concentrates can go way past the cigarettes. There are too many flavors to count. There are endless amounts that you can get. There's cotton candy, little um, peppermint. So that tastes like pancakes, coffee flavor. I heard one of those unicorn puke. It sounds like cartoon flavors or something. It makes them seem a little bit more kid friendly, so people are like okay with doing it. Some of my friends, they're sponsored by vape companies. They just get sent stuff for free because then they like make YouTube videos of all the tricks that they're doing and they're like, oh, this is the juice I'm using, this is the mod I'm using. A lot of people post them on their Snapchat stories or Instagram of them vaping. They tend to be more popular. You know, I can uh, look up vape and a whole bunch of videos will come up and I can see what kind of cool tricks they're doing, learn what the name is, and I can go look it up on YouTube how to do it. It's the whole culture. It's kind of a big deal for a lot of people that I know. Sometimes I do feel pressured into vaping with all the social media nowadays. It has a really big effect on what people just think about you. If you don't vape, you're looked at as uh, outsiders, so everybody does it. I think people that you would never expect would definitely be vapors. It's becoming like more and more popular. Vaping is considered cool in my group of friends. It might just be the fact that you're doing something you know you shouldn't be doing. There's no worry that our parents are going to find us vaping on social media. We've gotten really good at hiding it from our parents. I don't want their age, but it's just something that I do. I will let it affect my future. So I guess the message is, is that I think your home has to have the amount of security as an airport, right? You should be looking at everything that your kids have and what they're doing. And if there's an object that's out of place that you don't recognize, I think that I think that <coughs> requires you to do some looking into uh, for any of the kids who are uh, involved in any of this kind of stuff. Um, our, our student population, I think, in the state was, I think, 55,000 on those surveys was the entire state's population. And we're talking about um, 40 kids, I think it was, or 40% of our 144, whatever that number is. That's a huge number. If you look at that per capita and figure out what, how many times that 40% uh, is into our 144 and of those 55,000, that's huge per capita. These kids are these kids are doing it and they're hurting themselves and they're trying to be smart and they're trying to um, hide it from the students and I mean hide it from the teachers and hide it from the parents and they're infusing illegal drugs inside of it. Some of them are Prussian. Um, uh, prescription medication inside of it. Uh, there's other drugs, not just marijuana that's being put in it. They said there's some hash oils. I think we've seen some other stuff. Uh, there's an investigation I think that they're doing that's involved in the uh, companies on the internet who will sell that kind of stuff, particularly for these vape uh, products. So they're not getting it from the stores down here. They're getting it from the computer, and the computer is in everybody's hands because it's their cell phone. Um, I think I'll do real quick just the WMUR because it brings us to here in our uh, communities. I'll get paid by these people to put them on there. So. <laughs>
this and an empty cigarette? That's a good question. So there are many different types of electronic cigarettes or electronic vaping uh, devices on the market. This is just one of them. Uh, however, what makes this concerning is that uh, these products, the Juul products, have a higher concentration of nicotine in them than um, most other electronic vaping products on the market. And in fact, this one Juul pod has the uh, same amount of nicotine as is in a pack of cigarettes. That's a very high concentration of nicotine in a very <coughs> So I think the important part is, is um, one, the addiction, right? The nicotine is what the addiction is in cigarettes, cigars, any of the tobacco products. And that one little pot of Juul, which is probably less than a square inch, is the um, equivalent of one pack of cigarettes, the amount of nicotine. So the companies aren't foolish, right? It's like R.J. Reynolds and Camel and Marlboro and all those guys. It was the nicotine that was the addiction that kept selling their own product. They really didn't have to advertise. It was the addiction just like alcohol is the addiction. And this is the addiction to these products. There are some states that are on a move now putting their um, age to buy tobacco products from 18 to 21. And for the obvious reasons, that we talked about the brain, um, and the professionals much smarter than me talk about the brain still developing well into their 20s, and yet we're putting an age restriction of 18 on stuff like this. Uh, but alcohol, which has the same addiction and the same issues to the brain is 21. So again, this is just kind of just going back over everything, which is just a survey from um, Yale University, uh, which is, oh, I'm sure Yale does a lot of the surveys like our school does to find out information, what's going on and who's doing what, and the amount of people that are infusing their e-cigs or their um, stuff into hash oils and marijuana. My um, doctors um, are talking about how it's going after our, the, the uh, developing of a young brain, leading to memory loss. Um, Altering the person's existence for the rest of their life, I think that's a huge impact statement um, in that letter from a doctor to say something like that. Uh, this is one of the handouts that's out back. It talks about the risk of what they are. Um, early use in adolescence of the nicotine causes changes to the brain's lifelong addiction. Um, eye, ear, and uh, throat irritation. Um, because of the chemicals during the transition of the vaporizing uh, liquid into a uh, vapor. Uh, nicotine known to have effects in the cardiovascular muscles. Um, all of those problems that are existing in there. I think what we don't know right now is we don't know the nicotine effect, right? So we know that cigarettes and those kind of um, tobacco products, which actually takes a fire and burns something and then inhales it, it's the carcinogenics that are in that smoke that we know that are causing the cancer. I think that's an issue with the vape, is that I don't think they've connected any cancer cases to the e-vape, the east of the cigarettes, and any of that kind of stuff, but there are studies that are looking at that. And again, this is a handout that's on the back table about the stuff if you want to pick one up. Um, I think we kind of touched on it, but our statistics for 2017 youth risk survey, the number of students who use vapor products, 61 out of 143, um, or 42%, which is higher than our region. And the region is about, uh, how many people, Sean, in the region? 2037. So 2037 in the region, is uh, our percentage is higher. And as I said before, the state's number is 54,300 and something uh, total students in the state. So we're higher than our region, and we're higher than the state's uh, percentage. Not by a whole lot, and not by a staggering number, but that's still a concern. 
Uh, number of students who have used a vape or e-cigarette in the past 30 days. For us, 25.6%. Uh, um, and again, we're higher than the region and we're higher than the state. Sunapee, the town of Sunapee is higher than the region and we're higher than the state. Number of students who smoke cigarettes, I think that's important because I think that's what um, some people may feel like it's the gateway into this kind of stuff, is trying other stuff. Cigarettes may be more readily available. Um, I, I actually think cigarettes are, are use is probably, uh, nicotine use is probably on the decline. It's not like it used to be for people, I think because we've gotten a lot smarter with what's happening and um, the medical problems it has. Um, but 9.8% of our students um, are smoking. The region is higher at 11, and the state is um, less than us at 7.8% for cigarette use. Um, like I said, this is the Surgeon General video. It's about seven minutes, but I do think it's important to listen to um, somebody from that authority as to um, their, their um, take on the e-cigarettes. <coughs>
separate issue from whether kids should be using e-cigarettes. Kids should not be using e-cigarettes. They're nicotine products, nicotine is addictive, and it's harmful effects in the development brain. But the separate question has been raised, well, for people who are, are having a hard time quitting, uh, e-cigarettes uh, may be able to help them. But here's what we, here's what the science tells us, which is the science doesn't give us a definitive answer yet as to whether or not uh, e-cigarettes are both safe and effective for cessation. And until they do, until we know that for sure, we can't recommend them for cessation. For example, we wouldn't know how much to recommend, or what dosage, or what kind of people, what kind of side effects we should look out for. This is the reason that anything that we recommend for cessation, or for medical purposes, we put through a rigorous review. We have to go through an FDA review process so we can be assured about safety and efficacy. And until we have that kind of rigor in science, uh, we should be recommending uh, e-cigarettes as cessation devices. So that's sort of the, the, what you need to know about e-cigarettes. But there's a lot more to be said. There's a there's a passionate community of people who uh, who believe that e-cigarette use should be uh, allowed, that it should be uh, you know, be put forth as a as a tool for cessation. Um, and you know, and it may very well be that once we gather all the science and do the studies we need to do, we might find that e-cigarettes are safe and effective for cessation. But we don't know that right now. This is an area where I feel like it's essential that we allow the science to guide us when it comes to policy making and practice. So that's, so that's all I have for the presentation. I'm not an expert. <coughs> I figured that you could sit and watch what I'm watching, what I'm researching, um, and deduct from that what's there. Part of uh, putting this together, I spoke with uh, the people from Breathe New Hampshire. Um, who is a nonprofit group, I believe, and they will be um, um, hopefully sometime in June or July coming to um, Sunapi um, with me to put on um, a community forum like this that targets and talks about just um, the e-vaping and the cigarettes and all of that and have a lot more greater detail as it goes on. As I say, I think this is going to be our next youth epidemic. Um, because of the addiction that's in there, because of the unknown problems that go along with it. Um, there are all kinds of stuff that I think that we're all gonna have problems with. So. Um, with that, I don't wanna take up too much of the time. Um, if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, I do appreciate uh, the school and Russ and stuff for um, letting us up at the school. Uh, we are teaching in the health class in the high school. We do teach DARE in the fifth grade. Um, those are some some really key times, I think, for law enforcement to be there. Not just to teach there, but to get the kids used to us. We're a small community, we're a small police department, we're a small school. Um, we're either friends <coughs> with half of these kids and their families, or we have some acquaintance with them anyways. Um, and so being familiar <coughs> with them and the kids being comfortable with us, I think, is a positive in our community. And I think the example of that is <coughs> the Alcohol Awareness Week. As uh, the superintendent said, it's the kids' idea, we're there for support, the, the administrative staff is there for support, and if you've never been there for the week that they have this, it was the 16th through the 20th this uh, year of April, and all we were is support. The kids came up with an idea, we want to do this, sure, no problem. We got a wreck car up there for them, the fire department tore it apart, um, the police talked about how we do uh, investigations into um, crashes and if there's crimes, how do we do that? But there were week-long events that went on, um, the kids you probably saw handed out the red bracelets that had um, the Alcohol Awareness Week on it, and red is the color for that. What the kids did is they took facts from these youth risk surveys, and they typed them out and they attached them to each, bra each bracelet. So every time they gave out a bracelet, it had a fact on there from their own survey. But that was something they came up with. We helped them get in the bracelets, we helped them get there, um, and we supported them. The kids did a great job going on the local radio channels where they could um, advertise their events and stuff like that. And this is the second year in a row that they really took charge of it, and they were really proud of what they did, and I know we were really proud of it. Um, but I think that kind of stuff is key and important, because one of the things that's asked in here, um, which was one of the first things I picked up, was the number of percent of students who recall reading, hearing, or seeing a public message about avoiding alcohol or other illegal drugs in the past 12 months. 116 kids out of 144 said they saw that. That's huge. That, to me, 
is a success. That those kids are looking for that. You're seeing it. Either the school's doing the right stuff and we're putting it where <coughs> it needs to be. Either we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. The community's doing what they're supposed to be doing. The parents are doing what they're supposed to be doing, and the kids are picking up on it. So for 116 kids to see and recognize that they saw a warning somewhere as a public advertisement that this stuff is bad and not good, um, I think is a huge success for these kids. So, um, I could probably go on all night with this stuff, but somebody else is gonna talk, so thank you very much. Chair? Uh, Chief Cahill asked if I, uh, first of all, thank you for having me here tonight. Chief Cahill asked if I could just kind of be here as a representative for the uh, New Hampshire Attorney General's Drug Task Force, just to kind of talk about what the task force does, uh, what our particular team in this area does for Sullivan County. Um, so I, 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 like the Chief, I'm not an expert on this topic. I have a, a lieutenant that is well trained and uh, versed in this, so I kind of had to sit with him and pick his brain for some of these things. But uh, I also asked for some statistics as to, as to what's the common drugs being sold in, in our area today. Uh, I mean, we all hear on the news about, you know, heroin's huge, you know, it's, it's huge across the country. Um, hopefully what I tell you is not going to completely surprise you, but you may be surprised at the numbers that we have. So um, the Attorney General's Office for the state has a uh, drug task force. They're broken up across the state, several teams. Uh, we are the Western team here. The team is led by a lieutenant that works for me at the Sheriff's Office. Uh, he's the team leader. The team is made up of Le uh, an officer from the Lebanon Police Department, my lieutenant, a lieutenant from the Newport Police Department, um, an officer from the Keene Police Department, and an officer from the Claremont Police Department. So it's a grant that uh, the state, that we accept from the state to help um, fund this officer in, the, in our departments. But currently, uh, Keene and Claremont um, are dealing with some staffing issues, so we're down two people on the team. So really, there's three guys working um, all of Sullivan County, Northern Grafton County, or excuse me, Southern Grafton County and Northern Cheshire County. Um, so they're very, very busy. They work very diligently. Uh, they're always getting phone calls from uh, police chiefs in all the towns asking for them, you know, hey, we, we believe we have a dealer here. Uh, and they will work with those police departments to, to start to build a case against the, the drug dealers. And in reality, the, the dealers are the people that we want to target. They they are the, they go after the bigger fish all the time, and then they'll get a, they'll get this dealer, and they'll work on getting a, a dealer that's higher up on the chain. The one thing that may surprise you is that the drugs that are coming here are, are coming from Mexican car drug cartels. Um, they work their way; it's been traced and backtracked. They've made their way into the country, worked their way into New England, and I ninety one and I eighty nine and ninety three are, are major um, thoroughfares for drug trafficking uh, in our area. So with that being said, the, the most common drugs right now that are being sold in Sullivan County and that our team in particular works uh, to, to stop, marijuana is the number one, heroin is the number two, um, crack cocaine, uh, powdered cocaine, bath salts, is, which is one thing the chief had talked about, and these are not the, the things you put in the bath to soften your skin. Um, alpha PHP is something, and, and uh, I would I would ask you to, when you get a chance, to go on YouTube and, and just kind of do a look for videos for Alpha PHP. It would blow you away what these what this stuff is doing to people, and it's totally legal. Uh, it can be purchased on the web. Um, there is a uh, I printed off a, a home page from uh, the website that sells it. it. Comes from a different country, but you're able to purchase it and have it delivered here. And the way that bath salts are are legal is that every time the government um, changes, that, the yeah, changes the, the drug schedule and says this is a, an illegal substance. The companies that create the bath salts and, and these products, and this is the synthetic marijuana that you heard about also before, uh, they just change their chemical composition. So you can buy this in the local head shops. I did not check when I went into Evans whether they have it there, but I know that uh, there are several stores in the area, Newport, Claremont, you can walk in and you buy it. It's a little, little cellophane bag. Got a pretty picture on the front, kind of targets the kids, um, and it's and it's not made for human consumption. They put it right on the package, but everybody's smoking. We've had cases here. Uh, the last case that I dealt with was in Goshen. There was a young lady that was so whacked out from smoking bath salts that she had no idea where she was, and and it's right here in Goshen. So it's it is here in our county. Um, 
you know, and I'm not trying to scare you to say, hey, it's, it, we're rampant in each town in particular, but I will tell you that the, uh, the cases that they have right now, uh, let's see, the cases that they have worked have been New London, um, Canaan, Enfield, Lebanon, Claremont, Newport, uh, everything around us, or around Sunapee in particular, uh, have all had cases where there's been methamphetamine and cocaine. Uh, it's just the, it's the things that are out there today. And you may not see a typical dealer here in Claremont. I mean, a Claremont drug dealer would probably stick out if you saw him here. But my experience, and I'm sure, I know the chief's experience has also been that um, someone who's going to sell drugs in, a, in one of the smaller towns is someone who is going to pick a very small network of people that they are willing to sell to. And they're not going to deviate from that because they trust those people, they'll sell to those people. And the way the drug task force builds cases and investigates these things are from confidential informants. It's their number one way that they, that they build cases. So if a police officer arrests someone on the side of the road for, let's say, operating after suspension, then they, it's just one, one case. And that person doesn't want to have to have this on their record. They may mention to the officer, hey, I know, I know something about drug sales and try to work, work the ability to uh, make this charge be dealt with, uh, with leniency, maybe go away if they're able to assist the drug task force in uh, making an arrest of a dealer. So that's kind of how they start to do it. I know that uh, Lieutenant Daniels from Newport PD has gone around the county. I think he's done it here in Sunapee, right? Yeah. Um, uh, has gone around the county and taught police officers how to obtain confidential informants because that's really the best way that they're they're able to build cases is those folks who don't want to go to jail for a offense that they committed, don't want to have something on their record, so they, they're willing to cooperate with the task force. Um, so I'll go back to the, uh, the list. So bath salts, the alpha PHP, uh, crystal meth, is now coming back. Uh, we had a really big issue with crystal meth back in 2010, and the one pot um, lab labs, basically, as the chief had said. And I have a picture up here of a recent case that happened in Claremont, uh, and one of those pictures is a two liter bottle that was a one pot meth lab. And you can see the batteries inside the, inside the bottle. My daughter just recently did a green up, I think it was Earth Day, they were, they were for her school they were picking up, and I, I told her before they started, if you see a bottle that looks like this, don't touch it. And it, as the chief said, it's, it's very volatile. It may have sat there dormant for a while. They pick up the bottle, it shakes and, and mixes those components inside, and somebody's going to get an arm blown off. Uh, they're very, very dangerous. Um, so the, the butane honey oil, which I uh, spoke of before uh, from that video, that's also another very volatile product, and that is sold on the black market as, as well as... Uh, I believe it's the dispensaries, right. uh, the, the marijuana dispensaries for folks that have um, medical marijuana cards and can go and purchase those things. Uh, that's one of the products that they sell. Um, Molly, which is another thing known as ecstasy in years past, that's starting to make a comeback. Molly is in the form of powder or um, pills, and that's coming back around. Uh, those are the primary drugs that are being sold here right now in Sullivan County. Uh, and. I would never want to say, you know, we don't have it in a particular town because if it's all around us, it's, it's here. It's just um, you have to hope that there's going to be an opportunity for a citizen to see something suspicious in their neighborhood, call the police and say, I believe that, you know, my neighbor's doing something suspicious. And then that's another way that, uh, that an investigation starts for, for the task force. Uh, we work very, very closely with all the departments in, as I said, Lower Grafton, Northern Cheshire, and all of Sullivan County. And the, and the team members that are on there right now are, are very, very busy. Um, so they, for 2018 so far, they've pulled 43 cases um, where, they've, where they're working on dealers. Uh, they're doing search warrants on vehicles, search warrants on homes. Uh, they've purchased crack, heroin, uh, cocaine, marijuana, and Suboxone. And that was, that's not one of the most popular ones, but that falls under <coughs> prescriptions. Uh, and I didn't even talk about prescriptions because they're not really in the top the top five now that, that are out there. Um, they've seized cash, uh, eight, 897 grams of marijuana, almost two grams of heroin, three guns, and a couple of grams of crystal methamphetamine already this year. So as you watch Channel 9 News, you see, you know, Lebanon's usually very busy. Well, Lebanon has a detective from Lebanon PD that's, that's on the team. Um, 
when Claremont gets a, a, a an officer on the team, they'll be working very heavily in Claremont. But uh, right now, Claremont's trying to get their staffing to where they need to be, and then they'll be putting a person on the team. But we uh, we have uh, Sullivan County Chiefs meetings every every few months, and uh, the lieutenant from the Drug Task Force comes and speaks to all the chiefs, lets them know that this is what the team's doing, this is what we're working on, and uh, always, always, always pushing for officers to, to provide confidential informants whenever they can. So that, that's the majority. I don't want to talk forever. I'm a talker. I could, I could sit up here for a while, but uh, I'm happy to take any questions that I could try to answer, but the, that's the kind of the major point of what, what I wanted to make tonight. What age are you seeing? Right, I, I, we have friends that, you know, we all have kids at different ages, and we all sort of, you know, oh, my kid would never do that. And I always say to my friend, I'm like, are you sure? Yeah. Right, like, oh, our kids are really young. And I'm like, are you sure? Yeah. You, know, you know what I mean? So what, what, like, what age would you say? Well, the interesting part about that is that they range. Um, you know, from, usually they're dealing with, with the majority is uh, adults. Late teens, you know, 18 up through adults. But however, I, I know Newport and Claremont utilize